how you sign in. Uh, I can, you know, if you're Christina Melanson on every sheet, and then all of a sudden for one day you're just CM, right? That's inferring that someone might be slipping in and signing. You know, in other words, be consistent with your name. There's no reason if you sign your name, Brian Campbell, Brian Campbell, Brian Campbell. But you know what, today, I'm feeling like a BC. <laughs> Makes no sense. Be consistent. Sign it the same way every time, okay? Or else I'm going to infer that you try to have someone do it for you. Don't hate play. So let's go. I actually have I have a gift for you all. Happy Friday the 13th on full moon. Oh, I get to call my first football game of the season. Uh, I've been the Belgium High public address announcer since 06, and you know why? Because I can speak English. And uh, that really helps when you're trying to communicate things from uh, Hey, Brian, we talk to you. Uh, thanks. Alright, so let's get this, uh, let's get this up and going. And I used to talk like everybody in my accent still comes out sometimes, but the reality is, is one of the reasons I beat my accent um, was to be a better communicator as an athletic trainer. When I was uh, working college sports, you know, I had volleyball girls that were from California, from Ohio, I had parents that had to talk to coaches from different countries. And uh, one time, I mean, I felt like this. There was uh, an athlete who got hurt, and I'm like, yeah, right, Dave, what are we going to do? And he did this, and they were just like, no, I'm good. They're walking on the phone and sticking out, blood shooting everywhere. Because the water boy just came out, you know, it was just kind of scary stuff. So just kind of weed that out and see if that's good. All right, I have a couple uh, sample questions uh, that I just came up with. Just, guys, just please know the intent isn't, mm, I got a couple questions. You, 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 uh, you're not going to see it. You're going to see the concept, but you're not going to see word for word, man. In class, I might say two plus two is four. And I know that some teachers or some classes, you know, when they say two plus two is four, they do may see two plus two is four. But I'm going to teach you how to do math. And in class, I'm going to give you an example, two plus two is four. But you're never going to see two plus two is four. You may see what's two plus three. You may see what's two plus one. So, so just know this is an example of the types of questions, how I ask questions and how I, I, I give answer options. And I want you to see it, to understand it from my perspective. I get to ask two questions in one for most of the questions that I ask. Two and one. And the reason I like to do two and one is because the four answer choices get to flip flop. You know? um, what letter and color is up on the board, and, and it might be a green five, green six, red five, red six. In other words, he said it's, it's one option of each, and then the last one is none of these. Um, and everyone's in the blue room, there's a none of these. So objects rotate in A and about and yeah. So. So you can technically answer that to the blank. You know, I, I think that's some of my big advice to students, that your, your, your instinct is let me get to the options. But sometimes those options can be more confusing than just trying to answer the question from what you know and then seeing which option matches what you know it is. So I'm not going to look at the answer choices. Objects rotate in planes, and they rotate about axes. Okay, then look at the options. Now I'm going to see who matches up. Plain, plain. Okay, process of elimination. Axis, axis. Axis, plain. Uh, you almost got it. Plain, axis, okay. And, and what if I put like uh, air in plain? I mean, it's something silly. Then, then it'll be like, oh, he didn't put the answer there. 
it. That, that's when none of these is present, when I literally didn't put the right answer. And I do not use none of these intentionally to trick you. I use it to check your confidence to know that, that the real answer is not listed. It's a confidence check. Because if you're not real confident in the material, oh, sorry, you're not going to put none of these. And then you're like, oh, the joke's on you, can't. I'm going to put all none of these, you know, just to show you how. I don't do a lot of them, but I do a few of them to assess your confidence in knowing the answer. Dude, I play, I'm the worst poker player in the world because I literally play with my cards out. Like, I had to stop playing with my friends because I mean, every time I had a good hand, I'd be like, you know what I mean? I, I, I can't hide, you know? The only time is when they thought I was trying to fool them, but I was just, man, I can't lie. So if I'm telling you what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm telling you the type of questions I'm going to ask, and I'm explaining why none of these is one of my options, is to check your confidence. Multiple choice should not be multiple guess, because none of these questions should ever be guessed. It's multiple confirmation. You have multiple and you know options to confirm what you know is correct. There will be no guessing if you know this. Thing. There may be guessing, but there should be what I'm trying to say. Right? The sagittal plane is blank associated with the blank. I feel like I'm doing a game show. Any game shows that kind of read questions like that? The Jeopardy. The sagittal plane is, okay, now maybe you can't answer that fill in the blank without some context. So let's kind of see what these options are. Always, always, sometimes, sometimes. And then I give an axis linking up with the plane. Now, what do we know about the sagittal plane? It's a dimension of spin, right? It's a dimension of rotational spin. It's an angular dimension. Objects can translate in their planes with a rotate. I mean, objects can translate in straight line dimensions, but objects can rotate in rotational dimensions. That's what a plane is. Sagittal has to be about bilateral. Even if it's from a relative perspective, meaning that it changes, guess what also changes? The bilateral axis. In other words, if you say, well, I'm going to change the way I view sagittal, by default, you must change how you view bilateral. The sagittal plane is always associated with the bilateral. Now again, let me reiterate. If you say, well, the sagittal plane can change if it's a local reference, all I'll say is that, yeah, that's true, but guess what also changes? The axis that spin moves with it as well. They're always linked together. There is no 50% divorce rate with these concepts. Sagittal bilateral, frontal AP, Transverse folder, always, always, always. Like a snake re recalling living, always. Yeah? No? I'll, I'll eventually find something he has that he has to get us. All right, everybody understand, so not only am I inputting information, I'm also trying to show you into my mind on how I'm going to ask questions. That even though technically there may be only like 30 to 35 questions, I'm actually assessing more like 60 bits of information. All right. Okay, let's start from the beginning of your package. Let's go over all the stuff you have to know. 
I've been known to ask questions about what's my last name. <laughs> and you know, and you know why I do that? Not often, but sometimes I'll say, what's my last name? That just to see if you read the syllabus, or just to see if you know why you're here, just to see, right? Um, or, you know, how do you if if you get a contact me? Right? If you don't really know, I'm not saying you got to know like who I am forever, but if you have a question for me, or you need to find me, you need to find my office, you need to email me. I think that's not important. You know who the teacher is, right? Um, All right, so um, a good way to practice is just uh, say my name, say my name. Uh, All right, commandments. Now, I would never, I used to make students memorize it, but then they were so smart, they were, uh, they were so smart. They would be like little acronyms to know to match up, and then that was the piece of purpose of learning. So all I can say is that if you take the time I'm going to say that I memorize, but just read it every time, almost like a warm-up before you start studying. These commandments are meant to help you not make mistakes when you're taking the test. They, they really are. They're, they're reminders. Um, I've been doing this. I started teaching here when I was 29 years old. Um, I, it was in the fall of 06. Right? And since the fall of 06, I mean, I'm, I'm almost halfway to retirement. But, but there's some similarities. Yeah, there's a lot of differences. There's similarities. And some of the similarities are I'm going over the test, so we're going, and I just see students, oh my God, this is a terrible mistake. And so these were meant, I kind of took data from all of those common perilous mistakes, and I just tried to create some reminders to just help you not make those sales mistakes. Okay? So that's what this is for. It's just meant to help steer you in the right direction to not make the silly mistakes. All right. What did, let's see if I can get some class feedback. I know it's tough when there's a lot of people. Uh, it's hard to want to talk. But what did I tell you we need to look out for that's kind of uh, tricky about seeing this picture in any text, in any context. Do you remember that? What did I tell you that that's, could be trouble if you just look at it? Yeah, you got to add some spin to it. In fact, when you see this picture, I'll, try, I'll give you some, some context. When you Google things like, so we obviously know that planes and axes have something to do with each other. They have planes and axes, planes and axes, planes and axes, right? Um, Burton, Ernie, Oreo and Cookie, you know, and hamburger, you know, they have something to do with each other. But if you look at planes definition, so if you just look at the definition, flat two-dimensional surface, you know, they, the, the definition doesn't jive with what it goes with, what axis definition. Axis, imagine on which a body rotates, an imaginary line on which a body rotates. And so, so you have plane that they give it to you in this kind of, um, I say a fantasy world picture, but, but, but we have these planes. And, and a common definition is uh, the planes uh, slice your body in the half. So the transverse plane, the top to bottom, that was, okay. that's it. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. Something to do with slicing me and there's a center of mass. But then when you apply it to the axis, then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, those particles don't look like they, they're, they're connected, all right? In other words, axis, a point about which a body rotates. Point about which a body rotates and chopping me into a half of them. See what I'm getting to? Those, those things don't, what, what, what makes those things connect and make sense? 
Or if the transverse plane cuts my body and it's like, is this the only place where the transverse plane lives? You know? In other words, if, am, am I moving my head in the transverse plane? You know? You could be like, well, no, because I, my head's not here. I mean, <laughs> do, I have to, do I have to let it? What that means is, what it still means is, when you see this picture, it is meant to add rotation to your center of mass. In anatomical position, how does your body spin in the transverse plane? How does your body spin in the sagittal plane? Or how does your body spin in the frontal plane? But once I start doing this, I still have some sagittal, some frontal, some transverse, but I have nothing to do with slicing my body into right and left paths. Is this slicing my body into right and left paths? Does this have anything to do with slicing my body? It, Nothing to do with slicing the body in the right and left hands. But you know what it does have? It has the consistency of my knees spinning in the same place as my body if I should rotate that way in my statue. Okay. One way you can visualize this, if this doesn't work, if you can't just literally imagine um, one student made this for me. It's pretty cool. She took the planes and did a sagittal drone on a transverse, and that way we can get it in context. Okay. Here is sagittal rotation. Here's frontal rotation. Here's transverse rotation. But just static like this, you know, the only way to really the only way to really see static and dynamic is imagining, anybody ever play Darth Vader with the, with the fan you have in your house? You go to it and you're like, oh, oh, I am your father, and talk into the fan. Uh, play a cool hot shot, but I know Darth Vader, but you did that. So imagine if we had a fan that was spinning really, really fast in the frontal plane. You may not see it spinning because it's happening so fast our eyes can't process it. So you may just see a, a white, you know, a white circular wall. And if I turn it into sagittal, you may just see a so technically that's really the only thing that can happen. It, it's as if those imaginary things were spinning so fast that all you saw was you know the blur that's created, but it still has everything to do with spin. Another example, if I'm, if I'm walking in a, in a swimming pool, and the swimming pool, but again, the, I try to get you to see why it's easy to get tricked or fooled. It's my job as a teacher. I'm, I'm not here to just read some stuff in the farm. I'm here to try to teach you to me, understand, and clarify. If I'm walking in a pool, and let's say it's um, you know, about four feet deep, and I'm about to do some water aerobics, Walking in the pool, I'm not walking in the transverse plane. That's what I'm trying to get to. Do you see how easy that would be to miss? Because you're like, oh, the pool kind of looks like that. But my center mass is translating. I'm going forward, back, left, right. Now, if I want it to spin the transverse plane of the pool, I have to do this. I have to rotate in the transfer. But can you see how it's so easy to miss? Is the chair. The chair, excuse me. I think you have my chair. Is the chair moving in the transverse plane? Do you see how easy it is for some people to say yes? But the answer is so easily no. What plane is the chair moving in? What plane is the chair moving in? Okay, who's Team Sagittal? We're gonna do um, we're gonna do Twilight. Team Edward, Team Jacob. Do you remember that? No, my wife was Team Jacob. I was Team 
I'm joking. You're probably hated, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Who's team satchel? Who's team frontal? Team transverse? Who does not want to pick a team? It, that's irrelevant. It's a great question, but it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. This chair is not moving in any plane. No plane. Like at the mode. No kicks. It's moving to your right. It's moving in the positive X. I feel like I'm casting spells. It's translating, but to give planage, what must it be doing? Rotating. Rotating. Did the chair in any way rotate? Mm -hmm. No. I was rotating things, but this wasn't about me. I asked you about the chair. But can you see how, if you look at this, and this was in a textbook. If you look at this, it's so easy to miss. I'm going with the transverse. I'm, I'm going with, in fact, you can make a case that it would have to be at least two planes. Because I'm moving with the frontal and I'm moving with the transverse. Now I'm moving with the satchel and I'm moving with the transverse. Well, which child do you love the best? Pick one. It has to be spin. Transverse. Translated something 
your, your instinct, you know, remember Pavel, ring the bell and sound it, man. I'm going to translate something in a straight line, and you're going to be like, Fadu. I'm just going to sal salivate the word Sadu. Because you're referencing something that is missing something, and that's me. Planes and axes. Axes, a point about which things rotate. So if something has to rotate about the axis, that should make sense that something has to rotate the plane. Alright? Any follow-up questions? Question. Anatomical position. Let's go over the players. We're going to be accountable for our first test. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, God. Hey, when I start doing those movie references, man, I'm going to start giving out bonus points for people who are not correct now. You bought my plan. Um, global local references, I use references to explain why things that might look different aren't. So in other words, if we look at these two pictures, right? I think Lindsay comes on the left, paper one thing is on the left. Globally, globally, you know, hey, one's out over here and one's up over here, over the top, sorry. But locally, if you tilt, if you put your right ear at your right shoulder and look at the picture on the left, you say, and you can freeze it and then rotate it back, you'd be like, yeah, there, there are bodies in technically the same. This is in the same position. So it's not as different as we think. And so joint motion is locally referenced. It's not globally referenced. Why is that important? It's important for a lot of reasons. But I need to teach you that just because, you know, you might have been introduced to the concepts of ab and abduction. That's awesome. I'm not here to introduce you to those concepts per se. I'm here to develop and get you to master the concepts of seeing what is and what isn't. I'll give you an example. If my shoulder was frozen, freeze rings! I can't move my shoulder if I try. I hurt. They're getting cruel. And watch it. Can I abduct my shoulder? Can I bring it up anymore? Well, not at my shoulder, because it got frozen. But look what happens if I just leave my trunk, or move my hips, or so the illusion of, oh, abduction. That didn't really happen. Other examples, right? If I'm pivoting about my right hip to grab something and my left leg goes out, doesn't that just tempt you to say extension of my left leg? But if I was in a cast and couldn't move my leg if I tried, I could still do this because it's technically still in its anatomical position. I could be standing on my left leg, do this, make it look like my right leg abducted, but yet it's still in its anatomical position. There's a lot of illusion that can happen. Guys, my job is so much more. I look at it. My job is so much more than just, you know, like Sesame Street. All right, boys and girls, today we're going to learn about elbow flexion and extension. I don't know why I like different country governments. Uh, that's not my job. My job is to show you how to see flexion and extension where there's a lot of stuff going on. Or to see how there's not elbow flexion and extension when someone might be doing stuff like this where they're moving up on top of the body part and the elbow never changed position. You know what I'm talking about. Doing little curls. Yeah. And that, that elbow's like, bro, can you show me? Are you going to tell them? 
a lot of illusions. And it's not the person who's doing that crazy stuff. That's not their job to know. They don't know what a, what a, a duty axial hinge joint is. All they know is functionality. Get weight up. Get weight out. Get weight in. You are the experts. You're going to need to be the ones to explain to them, Mr. Boudreau, that's not really working your elbow muscles the way we need them to work. They shall what you mean. I'm getting it up and down me. Yes, sir, Mr. Boudreau, you are. <laughs> but when you start, notice how your elbow is in like a 90 degree angle. And when you end, your elbow is still in a 90 degree angle. So there's, there's no motion there. In other words, you have to be the teacher. You have to be the facilitators of communication. You are going to be me trying to convey this material back to you. So again, it's, it's more than just kind of memorizing these basic things that we could all do in a weekend. Okay. So understanding perspectives helps us to explain why things that look different might be the same. Or help explain things that look the same and why they are different. Close your eyes. 
<laughs> the door to God, right? You know? In other words, I started here and then I went to there. That, I mean, that's where the before and after picture is going to be, right? It's going to be literally boom, blackout, boom. Or as I like to call blackout, time travel. So you see one, then you see the other. And you say, well, how did I have to move to get there? Guys, the knee can't spin like <laughs> to go back. That would be You have to move in a direction of extension. Left, east. I remember, these are independent of each other. So I could do like something like this. I could. And in this case, you <laughs> wouldn't, excuse me, Napoleon, maybe you a case of Dylan. Tito. Sorry, I get that right. Think about this. If I do this, right? Do you know what's not accurate enough? You say, oh, that was flexion and extension. That's not accurate enough. And do you understand why it's not accurate enough? Who did what? Right? Uh, who did what? How, how am I going to assess? You know which one went back home and which one further away from home. So if I do this, you should be having a conversation about what the right knee did and a separate conversation about what the left knee did. Right knee extension went back home. Left knee flexion went further away from home. The left knee now has to travel even further to go back home than the right knee did. What happens if you see this? We have a word for that. Both sides, bilateral, bilateral knee extension. And I don't mind it. I mean, it's not going to be on the test, but if, if you happen to say right and left knee extension, that's not wrong. I'm not going to delure numbers. Harry Potter man. Because it's just about being good communicators. And, and again, at the end of the day, we have to, I told you on the first selection, cat me do, right? They're both talking about the same thing. So it should make sense that there may be books, references that talk about a coronal plane. There's nothing wrong with that because coronal and frontal mean the same thing. Cat new. It's just that we in this class have to decide what we're going to call something so that when you study, there's consistency. When I'm assessing, there's consistency. We just have to have consistency with verbiage. So sometimes, look, there's, I, I'll give you an example. For those of you that work in clinics, your athletic, my athletic trainers, I know you know what I'm talking about here. External rotation versus lateral rotation. Do you think there's anything different? No. But half the time they'll call it external, half the time they're called internal. So we just kind of have to pick and roll with it. With the understanding that, hey guys, when, when you hear this, it's just a different name for the same thing. Cat and you. You know, I, I, I mentioned that, that one time we were having a conversation with the clinician uh, when I was in college. I, was to do that. I did a fellowship. An athletic training fellowship is called the Kenny Howard Fellowship at Auburn. I worked with Dr. Bob Macklin. Dr. Bob Macklin then took the place of Dr. Kenny Howard, who worked with uh, James Andrews. Like that dude came from this hospital, and we got to meet uh, old Jack, uh, Dr. Jack Houston before he died. But my point is, is that they were talking about the fibula collateral ligament. And again, this was before I had an open mind. So I first think of, whoa, there's this new ligament that they And it wasn't a new ligament. It's just what they call the lateral collateral ligament. There's just the tail of the top of it. It, it. It's just that it, it, um, we, we just have to be consistent for this class because, again, if you're studying with your groups, don't you kind of all have to be on the same page? So I'm not disrespecting what your clinician might call something. I'm just saying that, that, that sometimes we just have to pick one <laughs> and go with it for the purposes of consistency. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Sometimes we just have to pick one and go with it. All right, what's the position of the knees? 
He's blessed. Yeah. And what if he starts going back home? Back to Hong Kong? What motion was he observed? Extension. Yeah. And if he goes away from anatomical, he needs like to see like Is that easy? My shoulder is what? Flex. ESPN has been lying to you guys. Full extension. Yeah, maybe for the elbow, but guess what? The elbow was probably extended when they were just standing in the outfield before they started running. The only significant change was that you flexed the elbow. And if you say, well, how in the world does this get you in the field? Well, this, when added to this, when added to this, when added to this, gets you into the ball. All right? My right shoulder is flexed. If I go back home, extension is going to take me home. And if I go away from home anymore, flexion is going to get me further away from home. I'm already away from home, but more flexion will get me further. In normal motion, normal motion, I'm not talking about people who uh, are hypermobile, but even then, that's normal to them. Is there any such thing as hyper in normal ranges of motion that I've taught you? No. Hyper is excessive. Hypertrophy, excessive. Hyperventilation is not normal ventilation, right? Hypertension, a hyperactive child. Same thing with motion. When motion goes to the extreme ends of the range of motion, beyond what is normal, that is turned. And it's not just hyper Like You just imagine someone having a hyperextended knee. That just sounds icky. Because then he's not supposed to go that far. <laughs> a hyperextended elbow is not supposed to go that far. A hyperflexed cervical vertebra. I mean, it, it should make sense. It's just not supposed to do that. So the laws of mechanics dictate that if this is flexion and this is extension, it's that way the whole time. It doesn't cross a mythical, oh, no, I'm in hyperextension land. That would be like a, a clock, right? And the clock is going clockwise, 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 clockwise. Oh, I passed 12. Hyperclockwise. No, it's, it's clockwise around and counterclockwise around. It's flexion the whole time and it's extension the whole time. Now, you could say, well, wait, what about the whole anatomical? Easy. Extension to anatomical. Extension from anatomical. Flexion to anatomical. Flexion from anatomical. It's just like passing a new state, man. I'm traveling east into Mississippi. And then as soon as I cross that border, I'm traveling east. Away from Louisiana. You know, it's, it's that simple. So if I say flexion to anatomical of my shoulder, you know I have to be moving this way. It almost kind of insinuates what quadrant or where I'm moving within certain parts. Now, if I just say flexion, I could be anything. It's flexion this whole time. Away. But if I say flexion to, flexion from, okay. And there's other ways to communicate that with angles, you know, with flexing after so many degrees, blah, blah, blah. But all I'm trying to do is tell you what you're going to be responsible for on the test. What can get you into a ball and what can get you out of a ball? Fingers can get you into a ball. Wrists can get you in and out of a ball. Elbows can get you in and out of a ball. Shoulders can get you in and out of a ball. Cervical can get you in and out of a ball. Your trunk can get you in and out of a ball. Your hips can get you in and out of a ball. Your knees can get you in and out of a ball. And your ankles can get you in. And out. Look, it's Friday the 13th on a full moon. Some of you are going to be in this position at some time tonight. <laughs> Just want you to be prepared. And after whatever crazy crap happens to you, I want you to be like, okay, 
shoulder connection. You don't know, you don't know study, study time. All right, that'll be safe, guys. Make sure you sign the roll.